So I've never said on a podcast what I said to you a minute ago. You're completely right except one part. Months later, after we had hung out for a while, Andrew called me down to Moxie's. Some of these guys that are 20 years old saying they have CEO University should shut the fuck up. I really did think that it was going to bankrupt me. And what it ultimately happened is, what was the point where you decided that you wanted to see more than one girl? Oh, man. What is going on, you guys? Welcome back to another sit down. I got Justin Waller today. How we doing, man? I'm doing well, man. Good to be here, man. Yeah, we got the yacht out here in Miami and Brickwell, the backdrop behind us. We had to go out a little bit and go a little crazy for Justin today. Uh, you know, it's a tough life. What are you going to do on a weekday? Yeah, exactly. You know? Exactly. Do a podcast on a yacht. Yeah. Tough life. Tough life. First of all, for us. Yeah, yeah. For sure. But I appreciate you coming on. Shout out Thomas, your boy, hooking us up and setting us up. So yeah. for the people that don't know you, if they don't know you, go ahead and give them a rundown exactly what you do, your background, and now what we got going on today. Yeah, I'm Justin Waller. I, I grew up in South Louisiana. I own a steel company that's been open for 15 years. I own 308 real estate doors currently. About to start a fund this year so we can grow that. I do have an online presence. I do not have a YouTube account anymore, but I do have an Instagram. And so we're still pumping content out there on my email list uh, at justinwinwaller.com. And uh, anybody looking at us can find us in the live chat and then of course on Twitter. So uh, we're still out there pumping content every day. We're moving forward and doing podcasts with you. So here we are. Awesome. Awesome. I want to go into that more in terms of, I know a little bit about of your backstory in terms of getting into the construction business, stuff like that. But for the guys out there, everybody watching this right now is pretty much trying to be like some sort of online business owner. Yeah. So now that you have the best of both worlds and, you know, in terms of that, very success or very successful online uh, presence, online business, as well as a very successful construction company. What are some of the <coughs> skills that are cross pollinating that could be valuable for people to understand? Yeah. So what, one thing I would say is that most businesses, if, they, if you look at them like a math formula, if you take out X and you put in Y after you figure out what the product is, most businesses in a lot of way are the same. You're going to have to deal with people. You're going to have to build systems. You're going to have to be tough and you're always going to have to be working on the business. So for me, if I were to go start a new business tomorrow and I didn't know anything about said business, if you understand how a business actually works, if you understand how to actually build a business, a business, then you can be successful in almost anything you do. Of course, you're going to have to acquire competencies for that business and that skill set to build your systems around it. But also, in a lot of times, if you really know what you're doing, you can hire that talent that knows the product even better than you. One thing I'd say even about my metal building company is that I have guys that are substantially better at metal buildings than I will ever be. But they don't know how to build a business. They know how to build a building. And so understanding that as an entrepreneur, regardless of whether it's online or in a brick and mortar space is very, very important. If you can get 30,000 feet and look down at a business and understand how the pieces go together to make the engine run, to make the formula work, to solve for money, for profit, then I don't think there's many businesses you can't obtain. I think Elon Musk is a great example of that. Do you think Elon knows how to build a spaceship? No, he knows how to build a business. And for that reason, his businesses can build spaceships and cars and Twitter or X in this case. So very, very good game right there. And I remember I was hearing you talk about something pretty recently for the most part, just touching on this even more in terms of entrepreneurship is so glamorized nowadays, right? Everybody wants to be the next Iman Godzi, uh, whatever business guru maybe that you consume. You touched on the point of saying that maybe it's not the best decision for most people. If you have a certain skill set, if you're going to be uh, a great employee for somebody, you can make just as much as money, if not more, for the guy that's trying to start uh, his own personal brand or run an online business. It's just as profitable and just as valuable as being kind of like the secondhand man for an online business or in any business, honestly. So that's kind of not hypocritical, but interesting of me to say because I am an online business owner myself. But I know plenty of guys as well that are much better as like a second kind of uh, B player than an A player. And they're not forcing themselves to try and become an A player. They humbly know their, their position, they know their skills, and they know what they're good at. So for you to try and maybe bend out of that, I think is probably more detrimental than good. Now, in terms of you with hiring your employees, I know you have a very uh, stringent kind of hiring process, it sounds like the interview process, all this stuff. I actually asked your, your buddy, Andrew Tate, for a, cl a quick clip. What do you look for when hiring any sort of employee these days? So you have to make sure that you understand the personality 
and the type of person that is going to be in the position. As an entrepreneur or a business owner, your job is really to set people up to be graceful. So, for example, everybody kind of knows that engineers kind of have an introverted type person. They're not really good with people. They're good with numbers. They're a bit kind of autistic socially. I would never put that person in a sales position. I take the guy that's outgoing. You set him up, put him in the sales position because he's going to flourish naturally. One thing that people often forget, they think that they're going to plug in roles and responsibilities with experience in a college degree that that, chi- that, that kid, child, was kind of forced into or he thought his parents would like, but it might not naturally match up with who he is as a person. And for that reason, when he goes out into the world, if his true beingness, his true he is as a person, doesn't match up with that position in that company's organizational board, he's likely not to be successful because he's not going to have an energy to fulfill the roles and responsibilities of that role. And so a really good entrepreneur knows this and really evaluates this individual to make sure that their natural nature lines up with the position, not just their resume, because the resume is a big lie most of the time. Does the person match to this role? Can they be successful? So we look for intention. We, we do many, many layers of personality. We do many, many loaded questions to take things out of them. We watch how they act in the interview. I'll have people literally come into an office while I'm doing an interview just to see how they respond to the person walking into the room. Do they curl up? Do they join the conversation? Depending on the position. So there's a, there's a million things you can do, but understanding as a business owner, your job is to set somebody up to be graceful. So trying to find that true nature to them and then match that to what that position truly needs is really important. In addition, when you're starting out, the best thing you can do is fire yourself from the roles that you don't match up to. I love doing that. Because you have naturally, to. Naturally, I'm not the best sales individual. I'm a right. pe- I am a people person. I'm good at getting people together. But when it comes to the sales process, it's not my strength. Right. So I was actually talking with somebody else I had on recently, and they were telling me that you don't want to be too quick to hire, though. And I want to get your opinion on this, because for anyone on here listening that does have an online business trying to hire quickly, I went through the process of six months understanding the business, getting familiar with it, understanding the ins and outs of it, and before I wanted to go and hire somebody. That way I'm able to guide them. I know, like, what's pretty much going to be popping up on certain sales calls and stuff like that. And then they're able to be trained. How quick or let me re, let me reword this. When would you look to hire somebody to kind of fire yourself for that position? Well, there's a couple of things. I'd say two things about that. When you very first start off, one of the best exercises you can possibly do is build an organizational board to the potential of where you want to go. So build the organizational board 10 years out like when the company's as big as you think you can possibly get it, right? Then daily, and as the business goes on, you're gonna learn more and more about your business and things you need. So you make a list of all the things that you did that day. Let's say you sent an invoice, then you, I don't know, made a phone call to sell, then you set up some marketing campaigns, and and you make this big list, and at the end of the day you sit down, and then you match what the task was with the position in the org board, And then you start to see that company being built out. So that way, when it does come time to hire, you realize what you don't have an energy for, what will give you the best return on investment of capital to grow the business. And then you take that list that turned into an org board and five roles and responsibilities for each individual. And then you hand it to a person that matches that personality type. And when I say personality type, I'm talking about an energy for it. I'm not talking about like a Myers-Briggs. The person that has that natural energy for that capacity in that position, you put them in that role. And that first hire needs to be somebody. Hiring people are easy. There's no such thing as an expensive employee. You have to do the math on it. If I hire this sales guy, how much, and, and he does these five things every day, and I get that measurable given to me every day, and I know that he is performing these tasks, how much revenue does that mean? Good, how much profit? Okay, I paid the guy $100,000 a year, but if he's making 30 calls a day and he brings an extra million dollars at 30% profit, then he made me $200,000 a year when you subtract his $100,000 salary. He's not expensive. So if you can back into that math and really understand the roles and responsibilities of your company and really understand the organizational board and create a report where you know where these numbers are every day, It's impossible to lose money on a guy unless he flat out doesn't perform. 
which would ultimately be on you because you picked the wrong guy. And, ha- and having that accountability is what's going to save you in your business because hiring employees that don't work out has to be on you because if it's not, then it's always, you're giving that power away to other people, mm. you know? That was good. And you're basically reverse engineering the entire process. thousand percent. From like the, the top line back down. Yes. Um, and you grow into the org board. Yeah. So imagine the org board up on the wall, right? And all the positions are grayed out and you slowly start to fill them in and they click on and you know where you're going next and it's going to change. That's the thing about a business. It's like you're constantly working on it to refine it and make it better every day. You know, it's never over. I have a business that's 15 years old, makes me millions of dollars a year. I work on that bitch every day. Just a little bit here, a little bit there. Oh, we could change that. That can move. People, people talk about passive income. Passive income is bullshit. And, and if it was passive, would you even enjoy it? Would you? No, you wouldn't appreciate it. You wouldn't, no, you wouldn't enjoy it at all. You, you don't have anything to work on to tinker with. I'll never retire. You'll die. You will die. And so you can either work on it or you can exit it, sell it, you know. But uh, I think people really think that they're, they're going to, you know, set it all up and it's going to go away forever. I'll say that that business I'm talking about, all I do is get the report and then add a little here and there. I, don't, I work on that business maybe an hour a week. But... I'm still there. I'm still in it. And I have an active uh, operations manager that runs it. It took me over a decade to do that. So uh, it can be done. It can absolutely be done. And reverse engineering it and seeing the whole thing from 30,000 feet is the best way to do it. Because you're just looking down on little cogs that you can change. And the smallest adjustment can make a huge change, especially a business that has any size. So that's what I would do. Super solid. I remember as well, just kind of, you mentioned how long you've been doing this business for and stuff. I remember I heard you told a story when you were 27, you had a hundred grand in debt from this contract that fell through. Now, how did that happen? And just please go into the story of that. Yeah. So I was doing a job for a guy right outside of new Orleans and it was right. There was a major flood in Louisiana that flooded a bunch of things. And, um, this guy had a project and he, he was really spread out because a lot of contractors got a lot of work at that time. And I was building a strip mall for him and I bought the building and I erected the building, put the steel up, put the roof on it, put the walls on it, rented the equipment and uh, I sent him a bill and he was very late. He got to net 60 on me and I was in the position where I'm like, look, man, I got to get paid because I was late with my vendors. I paid the labor. And I'd paid for the equipment, for the crane to come in, to hang the steel, all that other stuff. But I owed the money for the building. And I wasn't in a position, because I had just gotten debt, where I could get debt with this manufacturer. And the manufacturer, if I didn't pay them on time, I would have lost my, my line of credit with them. Yeah. And I'm like, look, man, you have to pay me. So I went and met him, and he wrote me a check. And I wrote a check to the manufacturer. My check cleared. His check bounced. And I was 100 grand upside down, plus the labor, plus the equipment. And it was just a position where I was stretched out over a bunch of projects. One of the most important things in construction is cash flow and, and making that work. Any business, really, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Con- but construction is particularly hard because there's very long time frames. So there's long time frames on getting paid. You know, you bill, let's say you do all the work in January, you front that money. You bill on January 25th. You don't get paid till February 25th. So you're really damn near 60 days out off the rip, you know? And so that, that makes it tough. And you have multiple projects going on. That there's, a, there's a lot of cash going in and out of the business. And you get paid in large chunks. But then there's also retainage. So in construction, there's retainage. If there's 10% retainage on a million dollar contract, that's a hundred thousand dollars. And then if your profit margin is 15, well, you're, you're waiting on, you know, so it, it's construction. If you, if you don't know how to manage the cash correctly, it can get you in trouble. You can also make you a bunch of money. But the situation was basically this is that I needed the money. The business was doing over a million a year, but we were so busy and my, my overhead was so high. And it wasn't in an unhealthy place. I just needed the cash. Yeah. And I really did think that it was going to bankrupt me. And what it ultimately happened is the guy, I Googled him, and it turns out that he had not paid a bunch of contractors in Florida, actually. And that there was a news story about it. And I knew immediately he had no intention of paying me. And so I had to lean him 
in every parish in Louisiana and every county he owned property in. And a year and a half later, I got through it and I went to a real estate close and he tried to sell a house in St. Tammany Parish. And I went to a real estate closing and picked up my check for the amount of the contract plus the damages. It was a no, he didn't show up to court. And, uh, and so it, it was a complete slam dunk for me. But that's the other thing that people don't understand in business too. And that's why I don't sue people very often. Or I think that's the only time I've ever leaned a guy and went to court. And the reason is I got a default judgment, which means I had a piece of paper that said I won, but that is a vanity piece of paper. That doesn't mean he's gonna give you the money tomorrow. He might not have the money. So sometimes in business, I'll tell you right now, if a guy fucked me out of 10 grand tomorrow on a construction job or 20 grand or 25 grand, I'd be better off using my energy to just go make more money. Yeah. And, and you know when people say life isn't fair? Well, you fucking find out sometimes yeah. that it's not fair. So what you, you can't make your decision off fair in business. You have to make your decisions off what's the result going to be. And where's the best use of my energy to grow this business and succeed? And the best thing I can do is blow up on the internet and watch that guy watch me flex on his ass. That's all you can do. With probably. the Evo baby and the yeah. G-Wagon baby. Or the F-150. Oh, yeah, of course. The, la- the Lariat <laughs> or the King Ranch. Can't forget that one. Or the fact that we have over 200 men in 25 states right now. That's awesome. You know, what do you do? Like, I say this about hate. I had a guy hating on me on my Instagram today. He's mad at me because I posted my car. I told him. I said, Burpee. I said, it's all good, bro. I love you. He's like, no, you don't. I said, no, man, I don't think you understand. Yes, I do. Because the energy it would take me to hate you over a car I bought only because all my friends have these cars and I want to drive them on supercar rallies with my boys doesn't make sense to me. I can take that same energy on hating you and spend it on me and the people I love to create the life I want. And I promise you it will burn him substantially more to watch it than for me to have anger in my heart towards him. He can't touch me, man. I sleep easy, G. Easy on anybody that gets upset with me. Because hate's never served me. I know it serves a lot of people, or they say it does. But honestly, man, I find it to be a waste of energy because it doesn't motivate me to do better. What motivates me to do better is the man I'm going to become. Not trying to embarrass somebody else. That dude's already in pain. Why am I going to shit on him? Yeah, that's in terms of what's going to drive me, uh, what you said is like me, me seeing myself in the future, the man I want to become. Right. Bro, that's literally exactly how I even got here. I yeah. remember being like 15, 16. And I was like, I can see a future version of myself with the certain personality characteristics, the certain life setup and shit like that. That's what pushed me to kind of walk into that new me. And the, the hate and shit, I think it's kind of funny, honestly. I mean, obviously you get a lot more because you have a larger audience. Yeah, it's a scale thing. Yeah, It's a scale course. thing. It's coming, G. It's, it's, <laughs> com- it's coming. It's, it's funny, though, that people have the time to comment that stuff. Bro, they're in pain, man. You can't, ha- you can't hate those people. No. You didn't do anything to them. You know, me posting a video of me driving a car, I didn't do anything to that guy. Bro, you're just living. Yeah, I'm just living, bro. And, and it's Instagram. Who cares? There, I mean, th- what that guy doesn't know is he was an electrician, actually. I can promise you he's not seen my videos taken up for the tradesmen. Mm. You know? Oh, we love you for that. But people choose to like or not like you based on their own current situation and how they feel about themselves. People take up for me because they like me. And a lot of times people will choose what view. You can take the same thing that happened, Lamborghini post. One guy that doesn't like me is gonna say I'm an arrogant asshole. The next guy is gonna say I'm inspirational. And so when dealing with these things, you have to understand that people are going to choose to support or not support you based off of how you make them feel Mm -hmm. and what it is in their heart that they have for you, which a lot of times is reflective of themselves. For example, the young men that are supporting me all day, they want to and aspire to live a life much like I live. And that's a great thing because you know what? I used to be that young man and I'm still that young man. Look, Ken McElroy, which is a huge real estate guy, he's got a big platform, owns a bunch of high rises in Dallas, big, big boss, bro. He's one of the guys I look up to. I wanna be like Ken McElroy one day with real estate, okay? If I saw Ken posting about a new apartment building or a new skyscraper he bought 
with his Lambo out front or his jet that he owns, I'm not going to put a message in there and be like, oh, you're flexing or you're, you're, I'm going to be like, hell yeah, man, that's what I want to be when I grow up. There's a country song that I listen to quite often when I'm driving through my properties by Travis Tritt, and it's called I'm Going to Be Somebody Someday. And that song is very dear to my heart because when I wasn't doing as well as I'm doing now, which I'm very blessed to be in that position, I used to listen to that song. And I was dreaming about the man I was gonna become. And to this day, I still use that song in my Lamborghini top down Miami, Travis Tritt. People look at me crazy. I'm gonna be somebody someday. I'm not the man I want to become yet. And I'm never gonna get there. And I pray to God I never do, cause I die inside. You always, you always got to have that new level to be going after, bro. A thousand percent. I talk about it all the time. You have to find new mountains to climb. The most dangerous thing that could ever happen to a man is that he gets to the top of a mountain with nowhere to go because he can only sabotage himself down. Yep. That's game right there. He can only sabotage himself down. And oftentimes, because he's bored, he's going to do that with substances. He's going to start drinking. He's going to start smoking weed. He's going to start doing drugs. He's going to let women distract him a major vice major vice and look it's well known my my views on being a playboy <laughs> right but i never let it get in the way i would not have let a woman or two women or three women get in the way i might have brought them on the boat but i would have ignored them done my podcast done what i had to do and that's how you know it's not it's not affecting your yeah. situation. You know, you absorb women, you don't chase them. You chase your life and the person you're going to become and the women get in your way or chase you. And so as long as you can be in a place where you're constantly looking to the next place, next place, next place, next place and you don't let anything get in the way of that or hinder that, then you have a really good chance to be everything you ever wanted to be in life. 100%. Yeah. And now I, I want to go back a few moments. We'll get into sure. the relationship stuff soon. Yeah, sure. Or um, not. We don't even have to talk about women. I'm cool with it. <laughs> we'll brief on it a little bit. I can't get away from it, bro. <laughs> you want, I can't ever get away from talking about it. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, oh, that's right. So regarding your point, when you're out of a mountain to climb, when you have no other purpose, right? Um, when I was 19, when I was 20, uh, during the 2021 crypto run, and we'll yeah. get into crypto here in a minute too, that's when I made my like major, major bag. And from that point forward, from like 2021 of like April is when I cashed out. And for like 12 months, 12 to 14 months, I had no purpose. And it was the, the, amount, the most amount of money I ever had at the time, but also the most unsatisfied I've ever been. Because cool, I had, I had this money. I had no relationships in terms of people that I actually really, really wanted to connect with. And I was still living back at home in Jersey, small town with no sort of crazy opportunities. And I didn't know exactly what the steps were to take to get out of that. But what got me out of that comfort was understanding that if I stay in the situation right now, it's not going to lead to where I want to become and be the man that I want to become. So for anybody watching this that maybe is comfortable with their, with their life, maybe you are in a good position, maybe you're not, but you're still settling for less, you need to stop just being a bitch and really see what's possible in life. Coming even to Brickle, for example, remember the first time I came here, it shattered my belief system because back at home, once every three weeks, I would see Lamborghini and Ferrari. It was a rare occasion. Yeah. Out here, it's like, oh, it's popping everywhere, no matter where you go. So just not settling for maybe what you've been programmed through college or your parents, that will keep you depressed forever and kind of keep you uh, sedated forever. That's just my advice to get out of this, to get out of that kind of system of mentally not having a new mountain or not having a new challenge to pursue and get after and solve. But all yeah, that. So I want to say something to that. Go ahead. You're completely right, except one part. Most young men that are not performing, or most people, they're not being a little bitch. They don't have the consciousness of what's possible. And you just explained consciousness. You came here to see the Lambo, to see the yacht, to see the buildings, to see what's possible. Most men whether it's frame with women, money, uh, the lifestyle that they live, it's lack of consciousness, not that they're a pussy. 
They're not cowards. They're not pussies. They don't know any better. And the mistake they actually made is not consciously looking for another mountain to climb and looking for a better friend circle or going and putting themselves in an atmosphere like a Miami or a Dubai or a LA or even a Nashville, Tennessee. It depends what your heart is, man. Depends what your character is. Yeah, you. yeah. And, and another thing, just because I like Miami doesn't mean I have bad character. I wear suits and boots, bro. You know? I, I will walk in in a suit today, and tomorrow I'll have cowboy boots, and I'll go get my hands dirty and doing something. It's what you want and what you envision for your own life. But there's times that are very dangerous when you start to catch that man you want to become where you need to go out and see what is also out there for you so you can build that mountain in your mind so you have something to climb. These guys, they're not cowards. They simply don't have the consciousness to understand what's possible. And that's why I think what the internet does or what I wanna do is give that young man in that small town more consciousness, a goal to reach. So when he reaches it, he understands that he can go out and get more and then achieve that next thing. Because if he doesn't, He's gonna die inside, or he's gonna destruct himself. That's how and I that, was, and that's dangerous. Yeah. yeah. So, how old were you when you actually understood the importance of surrounding yourself with the good people as well as just a good work environment and lifestyle? Yeah. So, two things. When I was a junior in college, we were taking a bus trip to go play Arkansas, and they had a really good football team. They had this guy named Darren McFadden that played in the NFL for a bunch, and Felix Jones, and this guy named Peyton Hillis. They all played in the league. And uh, I thought I would read a book because it would be distracting. You, you don't want to think about the game too much. And I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I knew I wanted a business. I knew I wanted to have freedom in my life. And that's, and that's genuinely freedom and choice is what I want for anybody that follows me. And it's what I want for myself. It's what I want for my children. But I was trying to figure out how. And back then, YouTube wasn't as popular. And so I read that book and I knew what I wanted to do. I didn't know how, and then I built how, and then I got to this place around, I'd say 30, 31, where I was making a couple hundred grand a year, but I wasn't truly, I'd maxed out and I needed consciousness. And that's when I joined the world. And so at that point, that's when I really started spending time alone with people on YouTube that I aspired to be. I'd watch Brandon Carter, who's a good friend of mine now. I love Brandon Carter. Uh, I'd watch Grant Cardone. He DM'd me the other day, wants to do an interview. Uh, I'd watch e even even the guys from, what's the guy from I Ice Coffee Hour? Yeah, Graham Stephan. Graham Stephan. I bought Graham Stephan, the sickest drum, uh, I, don't, I don't know what it's called, the metal thing you hit. I'm not a drummer, but. Uh, uh, symbol? Yeah, symbol, yeah. <laughs> Graham Stephan's cool as fuck, by the way. Both those guys are really great. Uh, but I started watching all these guys and looking at their, what they were doing. I'd listen to Bigger Pockets all the time. I just did an interview with Brandon Turner in Hawaii. So it's, it's crazy for me. Only I lived a whole life before this. I was 35 years old when I made my first YouTube video. Yeah. But you have to understand that my generation was shut up and work. And I didn't want to come on the Internet until I was a liquid multimillionaire myself. And I think one of the challenges that young men have these days is that a lot of guys are putting out content when they've never really ran a business and they've never really made any money. They buy a course and regurgitate the course. You could tell it's just diluted information though. Yeah, it's diluted information. Well, what does hay look like after it comes out of a horse's ass? It looks like shit, right? It's still hay, technically kind of, but it, it's not the same. So, uh so I made that deal with myself because I, I, I figured around 28, I wanted to get into that space, but I wasn't ready yet. And so I wouldn't let myself. And I think a lot of these guys, like you see these accounts like Baller Busters, man, um, you know, they're fucking people up. And in some ways, I don't really have a problem with some of these accounts that, that are, you know, wrecking people. Now, there's some, of the, some of the guys that they might talk about, I might like them. Uh, and maybe they don't deserve it, but some of them possibly do, you know? And I'm not gonna say who I think should or should not be getting ridiculed, but at the same time, I say some of these guys that are, you know, 20 years old saying they have CEO University should shut the fuck up. And I think there'll be a day where that happens. Yeah, me too. What I like about what you seem to be doing, I don't know much about you, but a lot of you younger guys that are just doing interviews and, and growing 
and, and getting guys on there that can help people in their business. I don't know if you have products or whatever. And by the way, we can cut this if we have to. That's all good. We'll leave um, um, I like that you guys are reaching out to people that can help the people that follow you and you'll grow and develop just like I'm going to continue to grow and develop in it because what you have is something I didn't have. Every generation gets a new set of problems, excuse me, opportunities that could lead to problems. It, and every generation has it. So I'm never going to sit here and look at a guy like you that's hustling, that's reaching out to people and trying to grow a channel and be like, you know, he shouldn't be doing that. I think what you're doing is great. In fact, in 2024, not doing social media is suicide. It's suicide for business. So what I would say is that it's really important to know where you are and be true to yourself and make sure that at the end of the day that you feel good about what you did in business, uh, whether it's a brand or doing business with other people. And the time is going to come and finding that consciousness is going to be a really important part of that because it's going to set you on track to where you can go. And if you can do that, you can do it substantially faster because you're not driving through life without a direction. 100%. Having that like self-awareness and overall awareness is what's even made this possible, you know? Bro, 1000%. So I want to go back to you mentioned just your entire process of then consuming a bunch of content, getting you to where you are now mentally as well as just business wise. Somewhere in that journey, you built a relationship with Andrew Tate, right? With the whole war room. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, he reached out to you to want uh, to be a part of the team, right? Was that in Vegas when you guys met? No, I'll tell you exactly what happened. Go ahead. Uh, I met Tristan first at an event in Vegas. That's what it was. Me and Tristan hit it off. Months later, after we had hung out for a while, Andrew called me down to Moxie's right here in Miami. And I'd already started my YouTube channel. And he's like, hey, I see what you're doing. I obviously think you'll be successful at this. You see what I've built do you want to help me build it? And Andrew, me and Andrew are close, man. And we were pretty close at the time. We had been hanging out a good bit. And I was like, of course. And I took that very seriously. And it is what it is today. You know, and if I come out with a business tomorrow and I ask Andrew to support me, I have no doubt in my mind that he would support me. So Uh, then at the time, was the war room like a newer thing? Or like, how was that unfolding? I'd been in the war room for a little while. Yeah, I'd been in there for a little while. So uh, Andrew's not the easiest person to win over. You know, it takes time. He's very meticulous. He doesn't just friend you overnight. He's, he's not an easy person to make friends with in general because he has friends for 20 years. He's very loyal to those people. He's got day ones, man. I've become very close to the guys that he was friends with 20 years ago just because I've been hanging out with him. So like Rory, which go follow Rory, by the way. Uh, and Marcel, I Rory's mean, his trainer, right? His trainer? Yeah. Is that? My oh yeah, coach? bro. His trainer's a stud, bro. Dude, Storm Jim. That's my boy, bro. <laughs> He's a good guy. Yeah. Then uh, okay, cool, cool. I, another question I wanted to ask you, just talking about content evolving over the past few years, when you were consuming content and now creating content every day for the most part, is what made you really make that full-on commitment to making content? Because you were already doing great with construction, right? Yeah. You were just like, all right, I'm going to take this into my life right now. I'm going to add this on to everything else I got going on. What was the, what was the main catalyst and main kind of pushing over? Let me, re- let me rephrase that. What was the main catalyst and main uh, motivating factor for you to start making content consistently? Well, the first thing is like you have to understand the vehicle you're in. And so for construction, construction is a vehicle where you can get very wealthy. And real estate is a vehicle where you can get very wealthy. However... Doing content and being online allows you to reach people that align with you all over the world, which makes buying real estate easier, which makes doing construction easier. And then if you do an online model where people can buy from you all over the world, then that business model particularly is one of the most explosive business models that there is. And that's why I think guys in the real world do so well. That's why I think guys that have brands do so well, because they can find the people that align with their values that look at that person like they know, like, and trust them, and then they can buy something from them, oftentimes something they would have probably bought anyway. So for me, the more I do these podcasts, the more the people that are going to like me for who who I am are going to want to buy something from me or do something with me or partner with me or bring me a deal or meet me somewhere or bring me a contact that I would have gotten along with if I'd have met them in real life. 
And I think that's the most explosive thing you can do in the world right now is let the world know who you are and find the subset of people that really align with you and want to do things with you. So just more awareness and getting more eyeballs for people that fit and know your message that want to connect. Exactly. That want to connect with you that already connect with who you are. I want my soul to align with somebody, you know, I don't want to trick them into liking me. If I wanted to trick people into liking me, I think I would have a bigger following and I would have a way less hate because I would say things that sound good on camera that make people happy, but I'd rather tell the truth, help the people that are going to like me anyway. I have no problem with people disliking me. I simply ask that they dislike me for exactly who I am because that's the thing that's going to make the people that love me, love me for real. So that's the way I look at it. I'd rather have a million people that love me and five million people that hate me because I'd rather have that, fi- that one million that actually love me for exactly who I am and I don't ever have to wear a mask. I'm okay with that. That's how you build an authentic connection as well. Yeah, a thousand percent. Just being yourself because so many people come online trying to put on some front and obviously you know that too. So many people, even in Miami, is a, it's a bit of a clown show sometimes. Oh, right. yeah, look, it's crazy. I'm going to tell you something. I've made mistakes with things that I've said online before. Can you give an example of that? I can't think of anything right off the top of my head, but I'll tell you this. I've watched content of myself and said, I agree with what you said, Justin. I wish you wouldn't have said it that way. Maybe that's a part of that's well, it's not even that it's a part of growth. It's like one of my main goals just as a person, as I want to be graceful, I'm very passionate. So I will talk loud. I will maybe even talk fast or or, or take it up to a notch to, to get my point across or even just because I'm passionate about the subject. But there's times where I've looked at things I've said. I'm like, I agree with what you said. I wish you would have said it with a little more tact or maybe would have been more graceful in the way that you presented the message. And you'll find you and everybody will find you're not going to go undefeated doing podcast. You're going to say things that you need to objectively look at and to grow. Say, okay, I agree with what I said, but I could have said it like this, this and this because Although I'm right, and although I believe what I said, because I said it this way, nobody could hear my message because they got so offended it turned them off. Mm. And unfortunately, those people aren't going to give you a chance to hear anything else you have to say because they're going to be so deeply hurt by how you said it. And it takes maturity to realize that. And even me, myself, is guilty of that. There's been things I've said on shows, certainly the panel shows, where it's not that I disagree with what I said. I would have said it differently. And that's growth for even me because I've been doing this two and a half years. So I watch my content. We have something called the list of hate. I've heard you mention that before. Go into that. Yeah. And so to me, it's the healthiest system we have because if I see the hate, I can look at it and say, okay, do I think there's any truth in it? Oftentimes it's not what I said, but how I said it. And I look at that person. I say, okay, I get that. That person is in this situation. They see me with my tall, handsome ass, saying whatever I'm saying, with this stupid ass watch on that means nothing, and they think that I'm this type of person. Whose fault is that? Obviously, I made them feel that way. So for my growth and my maturity, I have to evaluate and calibrate so that person can actually hear what I say, not how I made them feel. How you make people feel is very important. So for me, I try to stay in touch with that Not so I can be Mr. Humble, but so I can really evaluate what I said and say it in a way that somebody can hear me, digest it, and hopefully grow from it. And that's all you can do. You have to manage yourself and mentor yourself in those ways. I've never heard of that perspective before. That It's really good because me, myself, and I know people watching this as well, I'm typically pretty blunt and pretty forward with most things I say. And as you've mentioned, it can kind of rub people the wrong way. And then they tune you out for everything else you have to say, even though it could be life changing. So that's a really good skill to have. And just be aware of that, how you're kind of framing certain messages and framing certain questions, words, just conversations in general. Sometimes the best way for somebody to hear you is to whisper. Sometimes. So food for thought. For sure. I'm definitely going to keep that in my back pocket and just remember that for everything going forward now. Yeah, just constantly evaluating yourself. Yeah. yeah. You, you ultimately answer yourself at the end of the day. And for you to really get better, it's like, like podcasts. I watch podcasts like I, w- I would watch game film. Always run it back and run try to get back. better. How, how could I have gotten better there? 
How could I have been more true to myself? How could I have had grace for people that are watching me to allow them to believe in themselves and lift them up rather than shoot them down or make them feel like it was not obtainable? There's nothing they can't do in this world, but how I talk can affect how they feel they can possibly do. If I encourage, they can grow. And I'd much rather go to the grave of being a person that was talked about as somebody that lifts someone up than someone that said, I'm better than you. Because I'm not better than anybody. Even that electrician that I was talking about earlier, what he doesn't understand about me is I had 10 years in the field on those steel jobs. I just was able to get my life in a different place. I'm not better than him. I just went out and found a different kind of consciousness and decided to put myself in a different position. I'm still from Louisiana. I will have on cowboy boots within the next five hours. I'm still the same guy. And so I want to lift up those guys. And that's why I talk so much about how important the tradesmen are. Because I'm not going to forget where I'm from. I'm just going to constantly be critiquing and calibrating who I am so people can see who I actually am. And if they hate me after that, then I'll sleep easy every night. I'm cool with it. You'd be going into these, like, deep dives. I don't think I've had somebody on that's doing that, so I really appreciate that. It's very yeah, valuable for yeah, the listener, man. 100%. Well, dude, you know what's crazy? Somebody told me today in that – we keep talking about this guy. It's fresh. It happened today. Somebody told me, he's like, hey, Justin, you don't owe this hater a response. And I say, oh, no, my friend. It's not about Mike because the guy's name's Mike. It's about the thousands of young men that are watching me respond to a person who's trying to publicly put me down. I'm not talking to Mike. I'm talking to all the young men that look to me for guidance on how to be a gentleman and go through this world and win. I do love the guy. I do want the guy to win. But also, instead of slamming him, which I could easily do and then try to embarrass him, I can be graceful and look even better than if I were to dunk on the guy. And the young man will see that and he'll say, okay, that's the kind of gentleman, that's the kind of man I want to become. Where did you learn to be so graceful with people? Like how? I don't think I learned to be graceful. I think I chose to be graceful based off of how I want to feel in my own heart. I want to be able to go to bed tonight and think, okay, where did I mess up? Because you're going to make mistakes. I don't care how big of a G you are. You're going to mess up, right? Where do I make mistakes? How can I fix it so I don't have to go to bed thinking about the mistake I made yesterday, tomorrow? Right? Yeah. So you're constantly getting better and better. And I think the best men and the strongest men can be vulnerable enough and honest enough, especially with their following, to say that. There's, I've never said on a podcast what I said to you a minute ago about there's things I wish I would have said different. But I want young men to hear that shit because... Some people will be like, oh, you're a pussy. You went back on your word. No, I didn't go back on my word. I wish I'd have said it differently. But if the young man that is going to follow me truly is going to hear what I say, he's going to say, oh, really strong guys can say they did this, would have done it that way, and moving forward they'll do it this way because he really cares about the people that follow him. Dude, I could go on the Internet right now and talk about all the awesome things about me and I've never made a mistake and you'll never be as good as me, it wouldn't serve it wouldn't it wouldn't sit good on my heart, man. There's no young man that follows me or you or anybody else that can't achieve what he wants in life. Whether I did it or the next guy did it. And you're never gonna be done growing and you're never gonna be the best version of yourself because you're always gonna be chasing that and moving the goal line. And I just want to be very clear about that, not because I'm cool, because I give a shit about the people that watch me. Yeah. That's it. Bombshell. <laughs> is what it is. Now, you mentioned a moment ago throughout your career and stuff, everybody makes mistakes, and there's always a lesson in mistakes. And the most important part when you're having or when you're going through some sort of mistake or looking back on something is to understand where you went wrong and how to prevent it again. So throughout all of your years so far, whether it's something online or even something in person, what do you think was the biggest mistake you've had in your career so far, and how did you pivot and adjust from that there was a time in my career when I believed that all the men that worked for me in the steel business thought like me and wanted the life that I wanted I wanted to make them all rich so I would try to set up these programs whether it was life insurance or 
all these systems that I thought that they would fill out all these checklists and we could grow and maybe become corporate one day and be like the Google of metal buildings. But I wasn't taking into consideration that I wasn't speaking their, not only their language in life, but I wasn't speaking their money language. Sometimes, as much as you want things for people, they don't want what you want in life. And can't force it. you can't force it. And you're not going to change anyone ever. I tried to save a lot of people. I tried to change the way a lot of people thought about life and about business and work. But I was putting a square peg in a round hole. And although it was my best of intentions to give to them, they would laugh me out of the room when I brought the insurance guy there to set up a life insurance plan and do you know, certain kind of profit sharing that would give them long pa- long-term compounding interest. They were like, give me a $2 raise. And for the longest time around money and business systems, I wasn't speaking their money language. And so what I had to learn is that you're not gonna change people. You have to meet them exactly where they are. And in order to do that, in this particular situation, some of those guys I found, they just want me to show up on a job site, put $200 cash in their bag and tell them don't tell their wife because they want to get drunk Friday night when they're out of town in Texas. They don't want a life insurance plan. They don't want that. They want the freedom to quit me for 25 cents tomorrow and maybe go work for the next guy. That, that's just where their soul is. They're journeymen. You know? And for me to try to change that, is disingenuous of me because I'm asking them to change who they are. And so again, it goes back to putting a person in the right position on the organizational board. I had to learn. Full circle. I had to learn that my job was to set them up to be graceful and let them be who they are fully inside the business. And it has to flow that way. And and it was hard in the beginning because I was reading books about structure and systems and checklists. Uh, I was doing a lot of work with E-Myth. I did E-Myth consulting. I had a personal consultant from E-Myth for two years and I'm building all these checklists and these systems. And I'm like, we'll never make a mistake on a job again if this guy will just flip, check the box. I was asking a iron worker to fill out fucking paperwork. Square peg in a round hole. Just because I wanted that didn't mean he was gonna do it. And so I had to find systems that would counterbalance that to make it work, which is something we talked about a minute ago. I started hiring women. All my management staff in my construction company are women. The women can fire everybody, particularly one woman that runs the entire company. And I make millions of dollars a year, and this woman is a boss, bro. She will fire every man in my company, why do you and th- they know it. Why do you think she's able to fire people in a heartless way? Number one, I think she really, really cares about me. I know she cares about me. That's, that's If I could give you any advice, especially on the first hire. This was not my first hire. This is probably my 400th hire, this woman. But if you can find a person that truly has your back, one person, and you truly align, then you both can dance the same song. And once two people are dancing, it's hard for the entire group not to dance to that rhythm because they know that you and that person cannot be broken. I would, in fact, I would go as far as to say I would rather take five people that we are truly aligned on a vision and a goal and we have each other's back completely than a hundred people with 80% intention. My first core value in every one of my companies is intent. I spend serious time with my main people, my inner circle people that work directly for me. Because most of my employees I don't talk to. We're, we're too big. I, I, like, I don't know them. Some of them I don't even fucking know. I'm, no, I'm dead serious. You can't. No, you know? that's good, I have 300-something yeah. people that work for me across all these businesses. There's no way I can know everything about them. I can care about them, about them. I can systematically make sure they're taken care of, and we have really good systems for that around their wives and travel and their birthdays. Like we know about these guys. I have somebody like assigned to love these people, but I don't personally know every man in my business. It's not possible. Neither does most business owners that have any real, real size. Doesn't make them a bad person. It's just not possible. 
And um, and so having those five to ten people that are you're really close with and you spend personal time with that are almost family to you. Family has nothing to do with blood. I totally agree with that. I always say, fuck time, fuck blood. I want to know, do our souls align at work too, by the way? It's not HR compliant, but I want to know, honestly, what are our views on life? Does that align for us? You know, And I can't hire a fire based off that because I'd get in trouble. But I generally know who those people are going to be, and I put most of my coaching into those people because I want those people to get behind me one thing that's really powerful about social media and i didn't see it coming it's not the money it's the fact that when a man comes to work for me now or a woman it's because they believe in me they align with me before that it was a mercenary now it's somebody that wants to help me lead the charge of what i'm trying to do in this world and there's a huge difference between the two i threw my hand up like that because when i had that uh, call with Tate. He said the same exact verbiage that is you. He he said you cannot hire mercenaries because they will leave when times are bad. That's right. Everyone's chill when times are good, but you need to hire somebody based off the mission and their belief in you. You just pretty much re said that same exact clip he just said. That's crazy. You know funny. You're I on get, the same page, bro. I get called a, a, a dollar store Tate sometimes, <laughs> and I'm okay with that because the reason Andrew and I are so close is because we're a lot alike. I'm not, let me say something, let me be very clear about something. I'm not Andrew Tate. I'm Justin Waller. I love Andrew Tate with all my heart. He's my brother. It's not a coincidence that we get along because we are very alike. I often say the best part of Andrew is a part that you'll never see. And I know that to be true. But I'm not Andrew and I don't wanna be Andrew. I want to be Justin and love and support my friend, somebody that I would consider a brother. But I'm not Andrew Tate. That was crazy. You pretty much said the same, same exact yeah, thing. I'm not surprised, man. I'm yeah. not surprised. When I first started watching Andrew, he was speaking your language. He spoke to me, bro. I, there's still, I, I still own the same truck I owned. I won't sell it. I'm too, I've been through too much with this truck. It's a white Ford Lariat F-150. Thomas drives it now. Okay. If you get in the driver's seat, there's a dent in the Ford emblem because I'm laughing on the wheel because I was laughing and I punched the steering wheel because of something Andrew said. La I was laughing because I had been saying it for years. Our souls align, bro. That goes back to the point. If your souls align, it's more important or more important than blood. A thousand percent. It's more important than blood. That's what it is. It, it, there's nothing that can replace it. And so I think probably a part of Andrew choosing to work with me was Andrew knows how to find talent number one but then number two I think he understood after we spent some time together that we are a lot alike and we do value the same things and so he asked me to do that and he I mean look man he he's asked a bunch of people to do that indirectly you know there's there's not Andrew has a lot of people that help push his stuff but I think the situation with me and him is that I think he thought I could do it on, on a larger scale. And, and I did that. And I'm proud that I helped him in that way. Yeah, it worked out. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Minus perfect. the fact I don't have a YouTube. Yeah. Which is like my biggest joke with Sterling Cooper right now. So like I think it's, well, like we're, we've been joking about not having a YouTube for like three days now because Sterling Cooper's in town. Yeah. How did you, how did you uh, lose your YouTube channel? I woke, up, I woke up one morning and I didn't, I, I lost three channels. And uh, I don't want to talk badly about YouTube, but I'd never had a strike and uh, they took the channel down and there was a vice article that came out that said why. And of course it's vice. Yeah, of course it's vice. But you know what? I don't, again, it goes back. I don't, it doesn't serve me to hold hate in my heart. What serves me is to envision who I'm going to become and keep becoming and go work on that. So I have no hate for YouTube. I have no hate for vice. It just doesn't serve me to, to hold, hold that because then you have to carry it. So the best thing I can do is work on what I can control, which is to try to grow my other platforms and to be as graceful as I can around the subject. Yeah, I didn't even know. Jacob actually told me that your channels got taken down uh, pretty recently. But 
as long as you still have your Instagram. Too. I don't even know if I want this on YouTube. Me talking about YouTube because because for what? You know? Then they're gonna then they're gonna text Zuck and then, then I'm gonna lose something else. So it is what then it I'll is. I'll lose man. my channel too. Yeah, bro. You never <laughs> know, bro. Say so I want to have more than one main girl, right? Uh huh. We got Mr. Playboy right here. How are you, are you introducing the idea of having more than one chick to your already kind of girl you're already seeing? My situation is very, very different than a lot of people's situation. And I think when I look at the things I've said online, it comes across as if I'm promoting it. And I'm not promoting it. It's just a preference of mine that... It's something I enjoy in my life. It is something I enjoy doing with the woman in my life. You know what I'm saying? Uh, okay, then so, how about this then? What was the point where you decided that you wanted to see more than one girl? Oh, man. I was in high school. But I didn't know how. And, uh, and again, because I didn't know how, I would just break up with the girl. But I still loved her. And that caused me a lot of pain. And a lot of time, growth comes from pain. And so I had to figure that out. And figuring that out, to me, has always been truth. And so now that I'm in a place where I can just speak truth, you can meet me, actually get to know me, I can tell you the truth, and then you can make the decision of whether it's worth it to you to still have me in your life. And fortunately for me, 99.9999% out of 100, the choice is to see me and spend time with me anyway. Not because I'm the world's best playboy, it's because I'm an actual good person in real life. Bro, Tristan nailed it one time. Some guy was trying to get on Tristan about his lifestyle. And he said, yeah, but I'm a good guy. And Tristan gave the best response I've ever seen. He said, you know what, but so am I. I'm kind, I'm generous, I'm willing to sit there and have a conversation and let them make a decision. I do not lie, and they choose me anyway. And so I'm not promoting it, but I do understand that it burns people when we say it. I'm not promoting it. I put family way up there on the pedestal. I believe the family union is one of the most important things to society, and maybe I get ridiculed for it, but I'm not sorry. I created a life where I can live on my terms and I'm gonna tell you the truth and you can choose to go. And fortunately for me, they don't. But this is not a promotion of the subject. I'm not proud, like in the past, you know what I would change about when I was talking about it? I was boasting about it and how I said it. But to be honest with you, it's really just matter of fact. I enjoy it. I'm not insecure. I don't need to tell you I slept with a bunch of women. I don't get anything from that, but I enjoy sending my wife a picture of a hot ass blonde and saying, what do you think about this one? So, a man that doesn't have that lifestyle, that's okay. It doesn't make him a loser. I do think you need experienced women. I think Myron's right about having a bunch of experience with mm -hmm. women and understanding female nature. Mm -hmm. But having 10 wives and 50 girlfriends, if that's not you, then don't, don't do it. Do it. Yeah. Don't do it. It doesn't make you cool, bro. Sleeping with a bunch of women doesn't make you cool. Just like anything else you do in life, you should do it because that's what you want to do. Not because what you think other people are going to think about you. Because it's going to leave you empty inside. I do not promote it. It's just a preference I have. It's a part of my life. And it's because I enjoy it for real. It's the same thing with the car. If I didn't enjoy, truly enjoy the car, why would I buy it just so people could see me in it? That's empty. It's empty. And everything in your life should be that way. Money, business, women, style, how you spend your time, your lifestyle. It's got to be true to you. And I think a big mistake that people make online is that they look at other people on Instagram and they choose the wrong mountain because they think that other people are going to like them because of it. But if they can't be authentic to themselves, they're not going to like themselves, which is a horrible road to go down. The moment that you don't pursue a life 
that you want and you pursue a life that you think you'll get happiness and pleasing others from is the moment that you'll be forever empty one as well as just not happy with your entire life exactly anytime you go try and please somebody else you're always going to fall short of expectations and always, fall, and always fall short and guess who guess what else you're also going to fall short of your own yeah and, and you have nobody to answer to but the man in the mirror that was a hell of a way to end the podcast there. Yes, sir. My man. I've enjoyed it, man. I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate it. And Thanks for you in the yacht, bro. Of course, of course. You guys, you know the word. Don't be motivated. Stay disciplined. And I will see you in the next episode. Nice, bro. How we do? Did all right? Hell yeah, man. Wow.